So good afternoon, everyone. Um, just whilst we're waiting for everyone to log into the site, I'll just give you a minute or two and then um, we'll start. Okay, so um, let's start and um, I'm sure a few more people will join us in a few seconds. So um, welcome to our latest webinar. My name is Julia Porter. I'm a partner at Data Protection Network Associates and I'm delighted that we're welcoming, welcoming excellent panel this afternoon for our discussion about transparency. So we've called it spicing up your privacy information. Hopefully it's not going to be quite that spicy, but um, we want to talk about how we make sure privacy information is as engaging and interesting as possible, as well as being useful. Um, and I'd like to thank our partners, OneTrust, um, for sponsoring this event this afternoon. Um, thank you very much. So thank you to everyone for joining us today. We're delighted to have you with us. Um, you may ask questions to the panel. As we go, um, there's a chat button on the screen um, where you can just input your questions and we will filter them through to our chair as we go along. A number of you submitted questions in advance and we plan to cover most of those shortly. Um, if you think of anything as you go along, please just write it down. Um, we are recording this session. Um, this means it will be available for you to review again tomorrow if you wish. And for those people who have registered but couldn't turn up this afternoon, they'll be able to see a copy. Um, there should be a link available for the recording by email about this time tomorrow afternoon. Um, you'll see our panel on the screen and we'll introduce you to all of them at the moment. Um, but first of all, I just want to start by um, introducing you to the Data Protection Network. I'm sure lots of you know who we are anyway, but um, we're a data protection consultancy. We've been around since 2014. Um, we provide consultancy services. So we help clients both large and small with data from privacy matters. We publish a wide range of topical articles, guides and opinion pieces. These are all freely available on our website, dpnetwork.org.uk. And I urge you to take a look. We keep all of our webinar recordings there as well. So there's plenty to sift through. We also provide training workshops for teams who handle personal data. Um, we pride ourselves on providing no-nonsense privacy advice, so they're engaging and practical sessions which you can then take back into your teams. And we also run events, and this is just one example of them, so we run regular webinars on topics that are interesting to our audience. So, um, as I said, I'd like to thank OneTrust today for their kind support. They've been a regular supporters with us, and we've got uh, Joe Byrne with us again today, so um, welcome, Joe. So... Um, what I'd also like to do now is just introduce you to Robert Bond, who is our chair for the day, who will provide us a little bit more information about himself, a little bit about One Trust, and also introduce the panel. So over to you, Robert. Thank you, Julia, and welcome everybody to the DPN webinar. Uh, as Julia says, we're very um, grateful to One Trust for sponsoring this webinar. As you can see, they are the number one fastest growing company on the 2020. 500. Uh, they have many, many significant customers around the world, of which I'm sure many of you will be customers, uh, and they provide a range of tools to uh, enable compliance. So we'll obviously be leaning on Joe when it comes to technical solutions. Um, I wanted to just briefly go through who we are. Obviously, um, I practice and have done for many years data protection. Uh, I also chair the advisory or the expert group for the Data Protection Network. 
Um, Julia, do you want to say a few words and then hand over to Philip? Yes, of course. So as I've said, I'm Julia Porter. My background is actually mainly marketing and advertising. I spent a number of years with major media owners, including ITV and The Guardian. So I've got very much of a practitioner's view of the world. I've spent the last 10 years thinking about data protection, but very much from a practical, no-nonsense approach, helping businesses embed good practice into um, their teams. Um, so, Philip, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Julia. Uh, my name is uh, Philip Stutzep. I'm a Group Data Protection Officer at the Inca slash IKEA. My legal, I'm with a legal background and I've been in uh, various organizations and currently I, I'm a DPO at, at Inca. So now uh, hand over to Fadelma to introduce herself. Fadelma, you're on mute. <laughs> my, <laughs> my, there's, there's always one. My, my words were lost. Well, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with everybody and hopefully you can hear me now. Uh, my name is Fadelma Good and I am co-lead of PwC's uh, data protection practice. I will hand over to Joe. Thanks so much. Um, I'm Joseph Byrne, a Principal Solutions Engineer at OneTrust. So my day-to-day -day role is to articulate the value of the solution. And um, today I'm going to hopefully contribute to the discussion from a technical standpoint and some of the things that are that we are capable of doing. Brilliant. Okay, so let's um, get going. So quickly, I'm just going to give you a number of slides just to talk about what we're going to talk about today, talk about what we're going to talk about. Um, first of all, we're going to look at creating the privacy notice. I think this is something that everyone has done at some point, how you can maintain the privacy notice and how we can bring it to life. And then after that, we'll have a panel discussion. This first section is going to be um, really quite short. So as usual, we have a couple of polls and our first poll today, which we'd like you to participate in is, um, when did you last review the content of your privacy notice? Was it within the last 12 months, within one to three years, around four years ago, ready for GDPR in May 2018, or don't know? <laughs> so off you go. Let's see what people have to say. Brilliant. That's, that's settled at a very large 80 plus percent who've uh, reviewed it in the last 12 months. Maybe we should have had a supplementary question was, if you have reviewed it in the last 12 months, was it to do with international data transfers? But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've, forgotten, I've forgotten about that. So thank you. So you're all having a good look at your privacy policies in the last year. So that's encouraging. So I guess the uh, first bit, everyone will know what you have to include in your privacy notice. We did an interesting article about this recently. So obviously the contact details, the purpose of processing, lawful basis for processing, what your data retention arrangements are, what individual rights individuals have, um, the right to withdraw consent and the right to lodge a complaint. Now, that looks a fairly straightforward list, but actually keeping up to date with what the business is doing means that the purpose of processing and particular lawful basis processing can become a bit challenging. And then in certain organizations, you may have to add other elements, whether you have a DPO or not, you want to provide the DPO details. Um, if you operate in Europe, you might want to add the data protection representative. If you use legitimate interests, you want to explain the basis on which you use legitimate interests. If you share data with uh, companies, then you need to talk about the recipients or categories of recipients who receive that data. Obviously you need to talk about international data transfers, which as we all know is quite challenging. Um, automated decision making, including profiling, is something you'd want to add in as well as anything to do with your suppliers and the contractual obligations. So that's sort of phase one. The next section then is around housekeeping. And I think as technology moves at such a pace, then keeping up to date with your privacy notice becomes more and more of a challenge. So you've got new technology, if you've got new teams, if you've got new business processes, all of those things may have an impact on what you put into your privacy notice. Um, record of processing activities, we know from all of our surveys and our consultancy experience that this can be a very challenging area of the business. And obviously this needs to be kept up to date because that becomes the source um, information for your privacy notice. Um, regulatory changes can have an impact and obviously international data transfers is the obvious example that we've recently encountered. 
Um, supplier due diligence is, is another one. So if you have got new suppliers or new categories of suppliers, you've outsourced some activities, then that needs to be reflected in the notice, as well as marketing innovations. As a marketer, I'm very aware of the fact that digital marketing grooves at a breakneck speed. So the kind of activities that go on in your marketing team can change week by week. And it's important to keep track of those and make sure that is reflected in your privacy notice. And then the next point, and this is where I want to um, start our second poll for today, um, is what do you do to breathe life into your privacy policy? So um, I think Simon's going to start the poll in a second. So what forms of privacy notice does your organisation have? Do you have a standard website privacy notice a script? Do you have a layered website privacy notice or with navigation links? Do you have a privacy notice in the form of a video or animation or don't know? So off you go. Let's see what results we get here. So again, a decent number. Obviously, everyone's got a privacy notice, but a large number with the standard website notice at 70 percent and then a layered policy at 25 percent. Then relatively small number. Well, very small number, actually, at 3 percent in the form of a video or animation. Um, and this certainly is an area that I think there is quite a lot of opportunity to clarify um, what you can do. So different ways of breathing life into policy, using different communication methods, animations, uh, infographics, those sort of things, use plain English. I think the average reading age of the population is either eight, nine or 10, depending on which piece of research you look at. But the point is, keep it nice and straightforward, use, use clear words. Um, include information tailored to different target audiences and we'll talk about children a bit later on in different audiences because not everyone's going to take the same information out of that notice. Use layers and it's good to see that a third of the audience today are using layered information already. Keep it short and sweet, certainly at that top level and then you can always go into the detail later if people want it and be upfront and transparent. And then I've got a few examples, and they're really quick ones, of what look like good practice. So the ICO is still one of the best in that they have um, animations, they have a layered policy, and they use language that's nice and clear. Um, Google, whatever you might think about Google, they've put a lot of effort into their privacy notices. They've produced some really nice videos and clear language, but also they've made it accessible so you can see that you can read the narrative um, as they go through their uh, videos. So that's quite interesting. Um, Uber, even though it's a lot of words, they've put in policies for each of their territories. So they're clearly highlighting to people which territory they should worry about. And then FIFA was one of the ones I liked, which uses um, really vibrant uh, photography, but also um, the, the copywriting has been done as if they're football fans. So it's very clearly football oriented. So that's really quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, other examples I came across, Airbnb, Facebook provides a lot of detail about what they do, even if you might not like it. Slack, language is very clear and easy to follow. The Guardian, which is my old uh, alma mater, um, do videos layered in plain English, so I'd say that, that's uh, pretty clear. Channel 4 is very clear, Apple, and also Superdrug is another one that's got a very nice video. And we'll talk about Klarna later, but actually after they're fine, Klarna have also produced some pretty um, good videos and uh, explanation of their privacy notices now as a result of their fine. So back to the panel um, and back to Robert, more to the point. We are going to talk about uh, the questions and also talk about examples of good practice. So I think we're going to do the good practice bit first. Yes, thank you very much, Julia, for that. And um, um, I'm actually going to ask Philip, um, if he could give us some examples of what um, IKEA do in terms of transparent privacy notices and so on. So, um, uh, Philip, over to you. Of course. Uh, thanks, Robert. Uh, you can imagine that we're speaking about a, a big multinational company, uh, which is standing behind its values. So today I would like to share a couple of examples. Uh, of how the information can be provided in a simplest, in a very simple way, but also understandable way for the for the people. So maybe Simon, if you can share the slides. Uh, this is an example from uh, IKEA website. 
And here you can see a layered approach that is being recommended by uh, EDPB and also by various data protection authorities. The idea is that you have the relevant information and if you would like to understand more then it's kind of following an onion approach. So you can click and understand more about what is and how your data is being processed. And also in this particular example, uh, what I like uh, uh, the most is actually the icons. So you can see that uh, it's quite visual. Uh, you can really see and go and look into, for instance, CCTV camera type of information by clicking on the icon. And actually these icons are being provided by Garante. Uh, they organize this type of, uh, you know, um, uh, startup uh, uh, research uh, where different companies uh, participated uh, in and ultimately these icons uh, uh, were the result a bit. So this is something that could be shared and could be used also by the participants uh, of this event. So yeah, this is quite useful to uh, break down uh, a complex type of privacy policy into what is relevant and to go step by step into the details of information because otherwise you can really uh, be uh, uh, provide a lot of information and overburden the individual that is uh, trying to understand more about how his or her person data is being processed. So maybe if we can move to the next slide. We just got Here. the guarantee slide on there, Philip. Yes, exactly. So this is something that uh, could be shared in, in the chat so people can have a link to the icons so they can choose and they can apply it in their privacy notes. So I think this is a good example of visualizing and making the things more simple. Now, the next one. Uh, this is very interesting because uh, we did a research and here I'd like uh, really to get the credits to the UX team. Uh, they did a research on how people are clicking on cookie banners. And here you can see that we are kind of using UX type of testing, user experience testing, in a way that can help with the privacy and conveying the right messages. We as a privacy professional, we are used to assess and trying to, to be stricter with a UX design. Uh, but in this case, actually, this is something that can, can help to avoid dark patterns. And in this research, you can see that there are two questions. So first of all, how people can be more conscious uh, regarding their preferences? And what is the starting screen that is most likely to provide cookie acceptance? So there are six different scenarios. And here you can see a heat map of how people are interacting with the different cookie banners. And everything counts, uh, which means that depending how you're providing the information, where you're placing the different links, this is quite important in the end of the day in order to ensure that individuals have the right choice. Uh, if you're looking at the darkest red, you can see that usually it's related to accept or reject all, and it takes a couple of seconds for people to click on this. So there is no kind of a, a, a long time taking such a decision. And if you look at the examples where there is a star, you can see that the choices are spread across the different options meaning that the way the information was presented is giving enough time for people to think about it and in the end of the day to select a different option. Uh, this is quite uh, interesting research and this is something that could really help avoid dark patterns such as lazy clicks. Lazy clicks means that you're just pressing the first thing that pops up in front of you and by providing the right level of information, this is something that could be supported. So really uh, uh, interesting and insightful research by the user acceptance team. So something that it's recommended other organization also to look at. And this is something that right now we are providing an example about cookie banner, but of course that it would be interesting to see how people are reacting to privacy notices as well, uh, especially uh, how they're clicking on the, on the links how they're appreciating a, a layer type of approach and etc. If we go to the next slide, 
we can see a couple of you know uh, key takeaways. So the first one is that people are spending less time before clicking accept all, before declining all. So you can see that there is a five seconds difference. Uh, people tend to click the close cross when it is there. I think that we are all used to that uh, because of using internet for quite a intensive, in, uh, quite extensive time period. Uh, almost half of the people interacted with the settings and clicked confirmed, mm -hmm. and 45% uh, accepted all from the first click. People try to select all the cookie types except marketing cookies. So I think uh, these are quite a good key takeaways uh, in the end of the day, showing that the whole concept here uh, needs to, 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 to adapt. And if you want, if you want to, to have privacy by design and by default, principle principles meaningful, we need to look at the design. And there is a plenty of space for novelties, as we can see here, taking into account, of course, the specific legislation and being compliant in the end of the day. Okay, if we go to the next slide, this is a, an example of a privacy notice uh, that is used for recruitment. And why I'm giving this example is because you can see that as a big multinational company, uh, you need to break it down the complexity in a way that the individual can find out what is necessary for him or her. And here you can see the different countries with the different languages, and it's a, a visual, so the people can understand how their personality is being processed. But if we think about, you know, if you'd like to do it in a simple way, uh, in a work way, or like listing the things, then you ended up in, a, in the unnecessary complexity. So this is just an idea how you can put a privacy notice at the same place, but to be presented to different people. So these are a couple of uh, examples that I provided it here. I would like also to mention a couple of other things that uh, uh, we are working at. And uh, it's a very interesting topic that somehow is driven by, by the market. Uh, and by saying by the market, I think that we need more startups and, and companies uh, to take uh, a real, to take a, a serious this topic and, and to think about the individuals uh, because transparency and fairness, uh, these are uh, the core when we're speaking about privacy. So a couple of other examples actually that are interesting. Um, one of them is quite innovative and it's uh, about a chatbot, uh, which is right now in a, in a test phase. But this chatbot actually is answering to a question related to privacy. Mm. And it's very interesting uh, how it works because we have uh, machine learning and also artificial intelligence behind it. Uh, of course, if all the privacy assessments are there and we are keeping an eye uh, on the uh, algorithm and making sure that uh, everything is compliant, but in the end, I think that this is also quite a good option to provide information to, to employees, maybe as a first instance, so they can go and ask and they can be served with information that they need instead of having a very long and very difficult to find you know, the right information type of notices. So this is also an example. Something else that actually came up uh, after having perhaps a, a bad experience is we're all aware of a type of a privacy notices generators where you can go online and for you know a relatively small amount of, uh, of money, you can have a kind of a blanket type of privacy notice. Um, this is something that as a DPO, usually when you're seeing such an example, uh, uh, you're concerned, of course. <laughs> but ultimately, behind that, uh, we can all agree that a big portion of uh, the information that is provided in the privacy notice could be standardized. And it's better when this is standardized to be reviewed by uh, legal, by privacy people, to ensure the right level of detail. And then other parts of the privacy notice to be adapted. So this is also a kind of a test uh, pilot that we are thinking about how to implement it in the in the right way because it could give a lot of standardization and it could ease the business 
in the end of the day. And at the same time, also is the privacy privacy team behind because if you have such a team, it's way easier to keep track also of the privacy notices versioning and all the maintenance that is behind having such such documentation. So okay. these are a couple of things that I, I shared with you. I hope that it's interesting. Thank you, Philip. And um, this, what you've showed us dovetails into a couple of questions that we've had in which are similar. Um, and I'm going to ask Fidelma if she could give her view on, on this particular question, which is, if you're in a group of companies where you have a privacy notice um, that is aimed at both B2B as well as B2C, how best should you present it? Should you split the privacy notice by B2B and a separate one for B2C? And then how do you drill down where the, the business is in different sectors? I mean, should you just have one big policy or should you do layered, I guess? Uh, thanks, Robert. And, and that's a, a really nice question because one of the fundamental rules that isn't stated in the ICO principles is write your notice for your audience. So from my perspective, if you've got two audiences, two primary audiences designed for them, and there's nothing to say that the design and the approach you take for consumers and businesses need to be fundamentally different, or, or sorry, I beg your pardon, need to be the same. They can be different. So you could take a, a, a video approach or I love the idea of a chatbot, you know, for consumers looking for the engaging, looking for those things versus a more business style, business format. But I would absolutely recommend this concept of layering or signposting. I love the simple images that Philip showed us, you know, those very simple. I mean, you can see that's a camera. Yeah. You, you, you know immediately what you're, you're looking at. Um, and Robert, you'll know uh, from talking with me in the past, I'm really also so keen if there is an approach that can be taken consistently, you know. So if we're looking at layered concepts and using images or words, the more businesses are looking to a harmonized element, I think it's going to benefit everybody. And I, I suppose, yes, so long as when you harmonize, you're um, not making it too generic. In other words, you've actually got to have a privacy policy that says what you do rather than cut, cutting and pasting somebody oh, else's, uh, which uh, <laughs> we've seen, we've we've seen, seen. Over the years. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. You've hit the uh, nail on the head. But, you know, uh, that image that tells me this is where I go to understand what this organisation does with CCTV. Yep. Yeah, yep. nothing more. Yep, and and I'm 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 going to ask Joe uh, just to comment on this from a from a technology supplier's point of view. Are you finding now that there is um, starting to be a yet yeah, harmonised or a commonality of icons here or not? Um, certainly, and within our. Um... Within our software, one of the options on uh, creating notices is to use uh, icons in the in the margin to help people browse to them. And the sort of broad majority of those are common things like maybe cameras or sprockets, all these sorts of things that people recognize. And it certainly will help them navigate that notice and find the information they need and uh, maybe uh, help them sift through the information that perhaps they don't need. Okay. And... Um... Julia, linked to this was, um, again, where you are a multinational, uh, much as Philip indicated, do you think the solution is to have a different policy for every single country or is there a compromise that you can have? You're on mute, Julia. 
rats. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I think it depends on the complexity of your organisation. So to have a, a tailored policy by territory, the, the the amount of effort required to keep all of them up to date, I should imagine, is is too onerous. So if you have a core set, and often when I talk to clients, you say there's a core set of kind of you know rules. Um, and ways in which you work, which often is based on GDPR, because GDPR is a very high standard. And then you start thinking about what the kind of the, the differences are rather than having something totally tailored. So um, the Uber example is quite interesting because they are a global business in lots of territories. So they did highlight the differences territory by territory. And actually, I thought Philip's example, the employment um, policies were good because you've got flags. It's clearly easy to understand which country you are in. Employment law, I should imagine, changes a lot, territory by territory, so it's probably quite hard to do employee ones with a standard. But fundamentally, and I think IKEA do this really well, it's like you've got to set out what your core values are and what you do as a business and how you behave as a business, and then you can build your privacy notice beyond that. So I think what you end up with is a bit of a hybrid, really. It's like these are our principles, this is the way we like to work, and then here is some detail. And the detail could be in the layered part of the policy as well. It doesn't need to be right at the top because I think people get quite confused. And then just one final point, and the FIFA one was quite interesting in that the way they've gone is targeting by target audience. So you've got, you know, people who go to football games, people who, who are partners. So actually they're going target audiences. And I should imagine they're probably saying globally they have very similar interests, so therefore we can make our policy, you know, harmonise it by groups. And again, you can easily identify yourself amongst those different target audiences. Although interestingly in theirs, they didn't have anything about children, which I thought was a shame. But um... I'm, Yeah, I'm going to come back to children in a minute because uh, we've got a couple of questions on that. But I, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to turn back to Fidelma for this next question, which is one of the requirements that we've got in the GDPR, EU and UK is that you're supposed to indicate the names of third parties with whom you may share data or in some instances the categories uh, and so one of the questions says should you be uh, naming every third party supplier or is there some leeway there? Um, so, uh, again, if we look to the ICO for guidance, they are very clear that actually the organisations that are in receipt of personal data need to be declared. But what you can do, again, to facilitate the access is describe those or list them under the nature of the purpose for the transfer so that you give me an indication of the organizations and what they are going to do. But yes, it's not one of the most helpful things for a, a short privacy notice for some of the businesses online. Yeah, and I suppose the, the challenge with that is, is that your privacy policy is now even more living and breathing because we change third parties. Yeah. Yep. And, and we're back then to that question about how do you, you know, keep people informed of those changes, which I think came in on the question set as well. Yep, yep. So on children, one of the questions we got was, do children really read privacy notices? In fact, do adults even read them? I know as privacy nerds, we all spend our time reading everybody's <laughs> privacy policy. But um, how... How do you, Julia, do you think we need to um, deal with children's data if that is part of our business? So, so it's an interesting question. And I think it's a bit of a chicken and egg question as well. It's like if we write long, impenetrable privacy notices, people aren't going to read them. So if we find ways of presenting the information in a dynamic and interesting way, whether it's explainers or videos or stories or whatever it is, you've got a better chance of people um, taking that on board. And so I guess my main point here is that you're faced with a marketing challenge and you're faced with providing interesting and dynamic visual, audio visual material 
which children are much more likely to take in than they will if it's a long document. So when, when I, I did something similar at The Guardian, and one of the challenges we had was actually going to the marketing team and saying, we want you to think about this as a branding challenge, because it is a branding challenge, and actually really talk about you know, how organisations talk to people. And we had one of our journalists write the script for our video, and it's just frankly fascinating how much better they are at writing than we are what a surprise so so you know go and find an expert who's good at explaining and good at creatively talking about things to go and do your video for you and and don't leave it to the legal team or because actually that's not necessarily what they're trained to do okay and certainly i know that with work that i do um with the Southwest Grid for Learning, who are part of the Safer Internet Center. We do a lot of research on how to engage with children. And we know that more than 50% uh, don't even bother with the privacy policy and about 30% that read it still don't understand it in many cases. Um, so we need to do more because I think certainly the ICO wants to feel that we are genuinely giving information that people want to understand and, and can understand. And we've got another question, and I'm going to ask Joe to, to come to this one. Uh, we're starting to see, particularly in the US, it's not quite the same here, but we're starting to see much more of a focus um, in, in Europe and the UK on accessible uh, digital services. How how are you finding organisations are adapting their policies to those that have disabilities, whether it's visual impairments, etc.? Are you seeing more innovative means of addressing accessibility by design? Um, that's obviously a, a very interesting challenge. Um, and what is often the case um, with website software and privacy software, the, uh, the default branding is accessible, but it's not very nice or aesthetically pleasing. And what is often the case is as soon as someone makes a change to it, it loses whatever status it had, double A or, or triple A. So I think there's a, there's a conflict there between making something pretty and, and making something accessible. Um, in some cases, you may choose to have maybe two notices or ensure that it's compatible with something like a, like a screen reader um, in, in addition, or there's a plain text version as well. Um, so there's ways to work around it. But it, it's something I have seen, but it's often seen as a sort of trade-off between making something aesthetically pleasing and making it accessible. Okay, thank you. Um... Any thoughts on that, Julia? Um, I, it, there's, I agree with Joe, really. I mean, there's not an awful lot done at the moment. You could send privacy notices to some people if they don't look at websites. So not everyone will have access to the web. Um, and in fact, um, I noticed a comment somewhere, I think it was on the chat actually, about how um, people hand out their privacy notice. So at the point when... Um, you're engaging with the organization, you might have something that's handed to them or there's a recording. So I think there's lots of different ways of doing it. I think we need to sort of step beyond the kind of, you know, the written text and also step beyond the internet. Because I think lots of people have defaulted to putting their privacy notice on their website because they assume everyone will see that. That's not necessarily the case. Okay. And um, I, I've got another question. I'm going to go to Philip with this one. Um, so the question is, you've got a group privacy notice, um, and obviously you're in a group situation where, where you're reviewing it, you discover that some localization that should have been put in place has not been. Um, what's the sort of risk-based approach you take when you're dealing with multiple jurisdictions like you are? Um, is that a fair question? I think that it's, it's, a, it's a very good question. And I'll answer it that I think it came up previously into the, into the discussion. There are specific areas that are uh, regulated by country laws. And I think that these are things that 
you should always look at uh, carefully. We're speaking about employment as an example, type of surveillance, etc. So yeah, these are things that you should always uh, rely on the local expertise of the, this network that usually uh, big multinational companies uh, have. Other important elements is, the, is that when you're outside of European Union, where we have a GDPR, you have a lot of specificities that needs to be taken into account. Now we have, a, for instance, new legislation in China, uh, specific rules in uh, Russia, as an example, related to localization, a specific uh, type of information that you, you need to provide, different legal basis. So I think that all those things, uh, when you are at the group, you need to keep track of. I'm not saying being an expert because most of them are being interpreted as we speak because it's one thing to have a legislation and then you're waiting for guidance and then you're waiting for best practices. We all experience with GDPR. We're still learning. But you need to be self-aware about the important elements and you need to keep yourself updated uh, when it comes to data privacy across the world. This is very important because it's not only the privacy notice that when you review it, you can spot uh, that there are things that local teams need to take into account, but also on a daily basis, you need to consider this you know, group vision. Huh? Uh, and this is quite, quite important. Uh, something else that I would like to come back maybe to the question related to children, uh, because it's a, a quite an interesting topic. And for me there, when we're speaking about children, the first thing is that privacy by design and by default principles should be adhered to. And if I can say like on steroids, so you need to be extra mindful there. I've been participating in a, a campaign by Mozilla uh, that was run maybe six or seven years ago in the Netherlands, where we actually met with children in a primary school and speaking about privacy with them. And honestly, I am I was quite surprised to see how aware they are because they are spending a huge amount of their time, most of the children, online, doing gaming and other things. So they're really well aware. And when you're focused on the right messages, I think that we can uh, really help this generation to be self-aware that privacy is vital moving forward. So I think that this is quite important to have this kind of a reflect uh, in the young generation that they can protect their personal data and therefore their data privacy and data protection rights here. Okay, thank you. There was another question that's come in just, just going back um, a bit. So th the question here is, is that... Um, for B2Bs that may have contractual obligations to provide a sub-processor list, how do we factor that into the privacy notice, which also needs to be available for our customers' end clients? Fidelma. Oh, my mic is broken. <laughs> <laughs> um. So uh, a, a couple uh, of elements to this, and I guess we see this element most strongly in, in cookie notices. I know we're focusing on privacy notices, but I think cookie notices are a great example of, of, of uh, where elements of this might be done. But I, I think um, one of, of the, the ways here is one, clarifying that in the context of uh, sub-processing, being able to link to that sub-processor's own website where that privacy notice is, is really uh, the most direct way Yeah, in terms of doing it. Of course, you need your contractual obligations uh, uh, dealt with separately, but for me, it, it is about that process. And when we work with website owners and talk them through these elements of understanding and responsibility, um, we find quite often that they need that guidance in developing 
a, a racy, a responsible, accountable, consulted and informed mm. matrix of roles for keeping the legal content on the website up to date and the suppliers, you know, those sub processors is one of the key areas and that obligation of building in uh, a website link and clarity in your notice that there will be a, a, a handoff of data. But um, it, it is one of the things uh, that I think is people see legal and it'd be interesting to hear your point on this, Robert and Philip, they see legal as having responsibility for legal content, not recognizing to Julia's point that A, it's a branding and B, it's a business responsibility uh, and procurement also have a role to play in it in the context of sort of ongoing contractual things. Yeah, Julia, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, um... I think it's it's quite problematic. Uh, media owners struggle with this a lot um, in that uh, they will have a whole bunch of partners they work with, with their advertising, digital advertising campaigns. So they've got to somehow or other explain who all these partners are, who no one's ever heard of, and then persuade people to kind of work their way through ticking all the boxes, which, again, no one wants to do. So, so I can't think of a good example at the moment of a media owner who's managed to present this information in a way that makes sense. I guess I go back to my previous point, which is actually if you take a values driven approach to building your privacy notice in the first place. So you you set out your stall as the type of organization you are, then I think you've got a better chance of explaining who all these sub processes are and getting people to do what's needed. But I think it's it's difficult because the other point that I know Fidelma gets quite aerated about is what happens after the data, what happens to the data after it's gone to the first sub processor. Mm. And do we know where it goes after that? And like the answer is no, we don't. And I'm, I'm interested, Joe. How how do you one trust, and how do other uh, vendors help with the the auditing of the privacy notice against what's actually happening in practice? And I'm particularly thinking with the controller to processor sub processor scenarios. How do you map that? Um, so within the tool, we have a data map which describes all the relationships and you would then, I suppose, rationalize that against the notice. The current release doesn't have a way of doing that automatically. So you'd need someone to have a look at uh, a look at both, but at least there would be some clarity there uh, between your notice and what you're actually doing and you would be able to spot discrepancies. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, what... I'm going, to, I'm going to go back to, to Julia on this one. So one of the questions we had is, if you're reviewing the privacy notice um, and when it was first drafted, there was almost an exclusive focus on consent as being the lawful ground, and suddenly now you're wiser with hindsight and realise that there are other lawful grounds... How do you update the policy? How do you communicate the changes to comply with the law? So it really rather depends, I guess, on what it relates to. So there's a, a famous uh, example of RNLI who set out to do consent and then decided actually maybe consent wasn't such a great idea mm -hmm. and now switched to legitimate interest and probably had a lot of pain migrating people to legitimate interest. And of course, it would only have been their mailed base they couldn't do that with um, uh, their email base if it's to do with staff I guess and I think there was a, a reference to staff then I guess the consultation with their staff would be very different to the consultation that you would do with RNLI customers so you can probably have a consultation process with the staff which is actually we can't get consent from you because it's not freely given so therefore we have to have a version of legitimate interest and I think that could be done face to face through teams or users, certainly on small groups. So the explanation is going to be far easier. In the RNLI case, my suspicion is that they've done a series of emails. I don't know for sure, but actually, you know, you've got to decide whether it's a material change and then you've got to communicate that material change and give people the options to change what they want to do. They may decide that they don't want to be associated with the organization. So the planning around making that change is really important. Don't just 
chuck out an email and hope it will be all right because you've got to be able to explain what you've done give people the chance to respond and then also make sure you're keeping a clear record of what changed because clearly making changes needs to be recorded somewhere and the date at which it happened also needs to be recorded somewhere yep and and i suppose that's one reason why you know we see on on good policies you know this policy was last updated on such and such a date i'm interested um how you deal with it ikea philip if you how do you how do you make people aware that the policy has changed both if it's a manual policy or a website or an app policy how do you reach out to people at the point you change that's a really good question and a question that yeah guidance uh, from privacy team and legal team is being sick uh, is being sick of course and uh, it's it's an important point uh, what is the threshold and we have a guidance uh, stemming from the working party opinion and then uh, also confirmed by the EDPB. I think it's really important and I think it was mentioned before um, when this threshold is being met so it's clear that you need to notify people about the change because it's significant that you can convey the message in the right way so telling people what exactly changed how exactly it's impacting them and what are the, the choices they have. And for this type of messages, I think that it's important to also have an expert uh, that can help you with the communication. So people with great communication skills to look at what you need to convey from legal standpoint, but at the same time to convey it in the right way. And I think that this is quite, quite important. And usually also for privacy notices, what I get used to do, to do in the review process is not only to involve legal people, but also to kind of send it over to, to the business people and to see if they can understand and provide you their feedback. Because if they cannot understand that, we cannot expect from the individuals to comprehend. So in a nutshell, what is important is, first of all, to know when you need to send such a updates and communication. And secondly, to be written in a very simple way that people can really understand. So these are the changes. This is how our impact full link to the privacy notice, of course, and then choice, depending on the situation uh, we're speaking about. But this is quite key in such situations. Yep. Thank you. And I've certainly found, and I'm putting my lawyer's hat on here, that um, when we've been doing due diligence, in the course of an acquisition or a, uh, a, a listing on the stock exchange, you found some companies have got policies that are so out of date, you begin to think that what they've been collecting is of no value at all because it's been collected on an unlawful, it's toxic. Mm. And I think, you know, the polling question was very useful about how, how often do you review your privacy policy? Because everything we've just been saying seems to indicate to me that it's it's a it's a work in process, work in progress. It's not a do it in 2018 and leave it for several years. Otherwise, it strikes me you're not managing data appropriately. Um, one of the other questions we've got, um, and um, I'll pass this um, to Joe. Are there any different approaches that you take when you're looking at privacy notices in, in social media environments, or is it the same as far as you're concerned as a website? Um, in social media, I would suggest that people consider a just-in-time notice rather than maybe a, a central privacy notice. So when you're about to do something, whether it's on the app or the website, that's going to impact your privacy, that's brought to your attention. And in some cases, it may ask you if you wish to proceed. I think placing that in the context of what you're doing is far more meaningful than, uh, than having that all in one location. And social media, because it's very uh, sort of interactive and it is 99% personal data, I would say, um, 
putting that into context and bringing it in at the right the right moment, I think, is, is going to deliver a lot more value to the data subject and uh, the organization as well. And, and actually on that just-in-time approach, certainly one of the things that I've seen a number of companies doing um, is embedding a link to the privacy notice in the footer of their emails and in mm. their marketing materials so that you're effectively saying in every touch point that you have with the individual, please go look at what we're doing. And so long as the link works and the privacy policy is up to date, I know the ICO has taken the view you're, you're doing everything you reasonably can to bring the policy to the attention of, of the individual. Um, and Robert, if I could yeah. just build on that, one of the things I've seen is exactly, uh, as you say, people looking to do this, but actually subsequently not being able to evidence the individuals who have seen an updated policy. So it's, it's absolutely your tech people form part of your team to help you actually maintain uh, the evidence of which privacy notice people have seen. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And, and um, I think you said earlier as well, which I'll just repeat, that um, doing the privacy notice is not the job of one team or one department, it's not legal because legal can create something that is designed to confuse more than it is to enlighten. And you need technology and sales and marketing and treasury and so on in there um, because you genuinely do want a policy that actually says what you do. Mm. And I think if you don't talk to the rest of the business teams, you're never going to have a privacy policy that is, is accurate. And Robert, if I could add one other group to that, that list you've given, your board. Yeah. Get your board members to visit your website and experience it as your customers do. Mm. And it is amazing how suddenly they get so much more about what you're advising them. Yep, yep, good point. We're coming towards the top of the hour, so I'm actually, and I'm looking, I don't see any other questions now, so I'm going to ask, um, uh, I'll start with, um, well, I, I'll treat yours as a final comment for Delma, so I'm going to turn to Joe and say any final points before we close. <laughs> Uh, certainly, there was a, a story I wanted to tell about children and privacy. A fellow privacy professional, um, I think this was at an event, he said, um, I let my children use any app they like, so long as they can explain the privacy policy to me, <laughs> which was <laughs> an interesting approach. But at, you could say as harsh but fair or tough love, maybe. But um, that's one way to educate children. And I, I agree with the remark made earlier that maybe this should be something we do in schools also. Um, so that children are aware that their data has value, um, that it's an, an important and it must be kept secure. So that was just a, a point I wanted to, to end on, yeah. yeah no, thank you. And, and actually just adding to that, I've often said, we have a highway code. We don't, you know, need long, long language to tell people, you know, that the green man means you cross the road. Mm -hmm. And we have food labelling, we have hazardous labelling, but we still don't have a composite Mm. highway code of the of the you know cyber highway we'll get there i imagine um philip any closing comments from you i would like to highlight again it's we need to be very simple in a way we are providing information to people being compliant but uh, being simple and being fair i think this is the, the key point that i would like to highlight and in this picture, I think that data protection officers are, are playing an extremely important role, making sure that this is being respected. Thank you. And um, I'm going to hand back to you to make closing remarks, Julia, uh, as we're just coming up to top of the hour. Great. Thanks, Robert. Um, so I guess my final comment is that I see these privacy notices as being a massive branding challenge and a communication challenge. So try to enlist the support of your colleagues in the business who are good communicators 
and use lots of different ways to communicate your information, whether it's infographics or explainers or talks or whatever it may be, chatbots, I love that idea. Just think of different ways of communication. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thank you to the panel. Thank you, Robert and Philip and uh, Joe and Fidelma, and particularly to Philip for his case study. It was really fascinating. And Philip's a, a new panelist for DPN, so hopefully we'll see him again one day soon. Um, and also thank you very much to the audience um, for joining us today. We um, really enjoyed talking and hopefully you will enjoy it or did enjoy it as well. And we look forward to seeing you next time. So thank you very much and goodbye. Bye.